Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Ko Christina Hopner toko inua. I'm really pleased to see all of you today here for this webinar with Michael Cameron, and we also have a second co-author of the paper that he'll be talking about, Barbara Fogarty Perry in the room. And before I kind of go into a little bit of biography about Michael, let, uh, let's all come together and center our thinking and have our focus on the session. So I'd like to start with a short karakia. Faya te maturanga kia marama, kia fai takai na mahi katoa, tua, tu maya tu kaha, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato ia tato katoa. And so it's my pleasure to be a representative here from Flans, uh, from the Executive Committee, and welcome Dr. Michael Cameron, who is Professor of Economics in the School of Accounting, Finance and Economics at the University of Waikato. He's also research, research associate in Tiniera, the Institute for Population Research at the university. Michael's current research interests include a range of topics in population economics, financial literacy, and also economics education. If you want to learn more about him and see all his research output, then please do feel free to go to his profile on the university website. And today, we are taking a closer look at the article that he co-authored with Barbara Fogarty Perry from Otago Polytechnic and Gemma Piercy from the University of Waikato that appeared in Joftel earlier in the well, a few months ago, last year, and entitled The Impacts of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Higher Education Students in New Zealand. You will find the link in the chat if you haven't had a chance to read that article just yet. But please do feel free and sit back. And I'd just like to hand over to Michael so that he can tell us all about um, that topic. Thank you so much. Kia ora, Christina. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, let me just share my screen. All right, hopefully everybody can see that now. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, so as Christina mentioned, this is uh, joint work with uh, Barbara uh, Fogarty-Perry, who's here with us today, uh, and Gemma PSC as well. Um, so they, they share all the good things about the paper and anything stupid that I say today is, is entirely on me. Um, they bear no responsibility for that. Um, so a little bit of background to start. Um, hopefully, uh, maybe I should have had a trigger warning on this slide. Hopefully this doesn't traumatize anybody too much uh, remembering what happened back in 2020. Um, so we moved to alert level three on the 23rd of March in 2020 and then straight to alert level four on the 25th of March. And, and this was not pre-signaled uh, to, to a great degree. Um, we had about two days notice uh, that the university was going to shift to uh, online teaching because we could no longer do uh, anything that was uh, in person. And so this was a, obviously a pretty dramatic shift uh, for us and a pretty dramatic shift uh, for students. Um, and so, uh, it's useful for us to think about what those dramatic shifts in the way uh, that teaching and learning are taking place, uh, what impact that's going to have on students. And, and of course, New Zealand was not alone in taking this approach. Um, other countries also uh, closed down or shifted universities online or placed restrictions on in-person classes or, or had all sorts of uh, responses, uh, some of which were more similar to New Zealand and some uh, which were not. <clears throat> um, then uh, in May of 2020, uh, we were approached by uh, Alex Aristovnik uh, and his colleagues at the University of Ljubljana in uh, Slovenia. We were asked to join an international study which was looking at the impacts of the pandemic and the lockdowns on students in higher education. And the intention of the study was to be uh, quite comprehensive in terms of its coverage of countries, 
uh, and in terms of uh, sample size. So uh, we, we undertook to take the New Zealand arm of the study, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, internationally, the study covered about 62 countries, about 30,000 students. Um, possibly one of the disappointing things from our perspective in terms of the international study was it turned out uh, that New Zealand was the only country in our region uh, of Oceania to, uh, to actually participate. So even though uh, there were some initial conversations with universities in, uh, in Australia and with the University of South Pacific in Fiji, um, none of those universities ended up actually following through and completing the study. So uh, if you do uh, follow up uh, through to the international study, you'll find that they report results for Oceania, uh, but those Oceania results are essentially just our results. Uh, for New Zealand. Um, so uh, as Christine mentioned, our paper was published last year in the Journal of Open Flexible and Distance Learning. Um, our research question was uh, essentially what was the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the life of higher education students in New Zealand and how did this compare with students in other countries? So we initially invited all of the uh, New Zealand universities to participate. We we did that in two ways. We uh, we sent an email to the um, Pro Vice Chancellor uh, of Teaching and Learning or their equivalent um, at each university. But we also approached each of the student unions uh, as well and invited them to participate. Um, sadly, only two universities actually agreed to participate. Uh, Victoria University in Wellington and our own University of Waikato agreed as well. Um, we had some interesting responses from some of the uh, universities saying that they were doing their own surveying, which, which is probably likely, um, but uh, I haven't seen any other results from any other universities. They certainly haven't been made public. So uh, as far as I know, uh, we are the only ones who have reported on a study like this uh, that has an international uh, comparator for New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, we did have some uh, students from other universities who did participate in the survey. I guess they received the link through their friends uh, who were at Victoria or Waikato, but there was only a small number of those. Um, so there was an online questionnaire. Uh, it was uh, administered out of uh, Ljubljana. Um, that was uh, in the field in the last week of May and the first week of June in 2020. And... Um, if your memory is uh, is not so great, we were still in lockdown at that stage. Um, so the students were still at home. Uh, all uh, classes were being delivered online. Um, so the students were uh, in a space where, uh, where we could have a look at what it was that they were experiencing while they were stuck at home. Um, the survey uh, asked for, asked questions on their demographic characteristics, but also asked a whole bunch of questions about academic life, about how studying from home, about their social and emotional life and, and life circumstances and, and their satisfaction with, uh, with various aspects of the, uh, of the studying from home experience. And so that's what I'm gonna focus most of the uh, presentation on today. Um, most of the questions were focused on the period of the pandemic at the time of the survey. And those are the questions that I'm gonna focus on. There were some questions that asked retrospectively about the time before the pandemic. Uh, we haven't done too much uh, with those questions and those responses. Um, then there was a final open-ended question that all of the students were asked, and that was about their general views or words of reflection about uh, COVID-19. Um, and so because that was an open-ended response, uh, we got, uh, from some students, we got nothing. Uh, from other students, we got uh, a, a short essay almost of their experiences. Um, and so uh, we uh, will analyze that data as well. Um, so uh, in terms of responses, we had 171 students who started the survey, uh, but we had 147 who did enough of the survey that we could actually uh, do some reasonable analysis uh, of their responses. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about what the outcome variables are because I'll present them as we go. Um, things like satisfaction with various aspects of, of teaching and learning. Um, but we looked at whether those differed by demographic characteristics, whether they differed by age or gender or citizenship, that's uh, domestic students versus international students, uh, whether they were full-time or part-time students, 
uh, what level of study that was a uh, bachelor's degree, master's or PhD. Uh, and their field of study, which was a very coarse, um, uh, a, a very coarse characterization of, of what, or categorization, I should say, of what their field of study is in, into only four categories. Um, we also looked at socioeconomic variables, so whether they had a scholarship or not. Uh, students were also asked to report whether they, uh, how, how well able they were to pay for their studies. Um, that was dichotomized into high ability to pay and low ability to pay. Um, whether the student had moved home uh, during the lockdown. Um, and lastly, uh, for those students who had a job uh, before the pandemic, whether they had lost their job. Uh, for that last question that I mentioned earlier, the open-ended one, we had 80 respondents who provided us with uh, uh, a response to that, uh, and we applied some thematic analysis uh, to those uh, responses. Um, so what was our sample like? Um, well, we had a pretty uh, even-ish split between uh, students who were aged under 20, those who were aged 20 to 24, and those who were aged 25 and over. Um, about 71% were female. Um, so this is a, a population that, which is not representative even of the uni two universities that, that uh, provided the bulk of the sample. Uh, so the, the sample is uh, older uh, and more female than the underlying student population is. 88% um, of them were domestic students, the rest were international. 88% were full-time students. That's not a typo, Those that was the same proportion for both of those. Um, the rest were part-time students. Uh, most of them were bachelor's degree students, but we have a substantial sample you can see who were postgraduate students as well. Uh, the field of study, um, the majority of students were in social sciences, um, but that's quite a broad uh, category uh, because it includes uh, things like education and business students as well. So um, the rest were uh, fairly evenly split between arts and humanities, um, applied sciences, which is things like engineering and medicine, oh, sorry, engineering and natural and life sciences, which also includes medicine. Um, a bit more than a quarter of students had a scholarship and about half of them uh, reported a high ability to pay with the rest uh, reporting low ability to pay. Um, about a quarter of students had moved home during the pandemic and of those who had a job, about 21% had lost, lost that job. Um, during that lockdown period. So comparing our sample with the international sample, it's fairly similar, although uh, it turns out that our sample was somewhat younger, even though I said it's kind of older than the, than the underlying student population in New Zealand, um, our uh, sample was, was slightly younger than uh, the sample internationally, uh, more female, much more concentrated in the social sciences. Um, and Interestingly, our sample had a, a substantially lower rate of job loss than the international sample. So uh, about 21% of our students who had jobs before the pandemic had lost their job, but in the international sample, that was over 60%. And I think that reflects uh, that New Zealand had uh, the wage subsidy in place, which allowed students to uh, maintain their employment status. Okay. So hopefully um, these slides are readable to you. You may have to turn your head on the side to uh, to read some of the uh, the text there. Um, but uh, let's start with uh, how satisfied uh, students were with various uh, online teaching and learning approaches. Um, so of course we couldn't have in-person lectures. So there was various things that we could replace in-person lectures with. Uh, we could have recorded video lectures. We could have video conference lectures or real time or, or Zoom lectures. Uh, we could simply put written stuff up or we could have forums or chats or, or things. We could uh, send uh, presentations to students or we could record audio lectures. And of course, there's many other alternatives as well. But those, those first five are the ones that the survey asked about. Um, students were asked to rate their satisfaction on a scale of one to five. Um, and so uh, this, uh, this figure presents the average uh, satisfaction rating that students gave for those different options. Um, and there's not a lot to choose between them, uh, but recorded video lectures came out uh, as the thing that students were most satisfied with. They were least satisfied with recorded audio lectures, but in terms of average, it's a difference between about 3.7 and about 3.1. So there's, there's not a great uh, amount of difference uh, in terms of how 
um, satisfied students were. And there weren't any demographic or socioeconomic differences that were that were really meaningful. There are, there are some that show up, and if you read the paper, you can you can see them. But I but I think we we could easily overinterpret um, the meaning of those of those differences. Um, similar thing with uh, tutorials. We could replace our tutorials with uh, tutorials that were in real time uh, using Zoom or some other video conferencing software. We could pre-record tutorials uh, uh, on video. We could pre-record them in an audio format. We could replace them with some written forum, whether that be synchronous or asynchronous. We could uh, have tutorial presentations that are simply sent to students and so on. There are, there are other options as well. Um, in the case of tutorials, it appeared that the students were most satisfied with real-time tutorials. So that's that's quite different from the lectures. If I just pop back a slide, uh, you can see that students were most um, were most satisfied with recorded video lectures, and then uh, real-time or video conference lectures came second. Uh, with tutorials, uh, it was very much the other way around. They much preferred uh, the in-person, well, not in-person, the <laughs> the on-screen real-time um tutorial uh, uh format rather than things that were recorded but again uh seemed reasonably satisfied regardless of what uh their previously in-person tutorials or workshops were being replaced with again though no no really meaningful differences between uh different demographic categories or different socioeconomic characteristics of the students um, if we look at student satisfaction with uh, with teaching and administrative support, support um, again, uh, students were pretty satisfied with lectures, a uh, little bit less satisfied with supervisions and mentorships, a little bit less satisfied again with tutorials or seminars or, or practicals. Um, now, this is where the characteristics of our sample becomes kind of important because about a quarter of our sample were postgraduate students. So uh, many of those students would have had supervision or mentorship relationships. If we'd had a sample that was much, much more dominated by undergraduate students, then, then these results might not be meaningful. But um, the supervisions and mentorships was important, particularly since we found that full-time students were actually less satisfied with those supervisions or mentorships. Um, so students who are who are full time uh, expecting to uh, be closely supervised by an academic in a uh, in a project, uh, and then suddenly find themselves online um, and having to uh, engage with that academic uh, through some virtual means uh, appear to be less satisfied overall. Um, Interestingly, for some reason, uh, female students were less satisfied with tutorials than, than were male students. So I don't have a good uh, explanation for that, but uh, if anybody else does, I'd really uh, welcome your insights. Um, if we expand out to other aspects of teaching and administrative support, um, students were really satisfied with teaching staff, uh, which is uh, good from my perspective. Um, and uh, happy with tutors as well. Uh, but then if we rank the other uh, aspects of uh, teaching and administrative support, um, we get down to uh, international office being the lowest ranked in finance and accounting and student counselling as well. Um, the, um, when we look at the demographic and, and socioeconomic characteristics, what we find here, though, is, is counselling sort of stands out. Uh, domestic students were more satisfied with counselling than international students, um, and students who had moved home were less satisfied with counselling services than, than those who had uh, stayed uh, presumably where they were uh, before the pandemic. If we look at uh, students' uh, academic work, the academic environment, um, students here were asked uh, whether they uh, agree or strongly agree or disagree or strongly disagree with a number of, of statements. And, and here you kind of have to put your head on the side to read these, I'm afraid. Um, so um, the first one there is uh, whether they agreed with it's more difficult to focus during the online teaching in comparison to on-site teaching. And nearly three quarters of students agreed with that, agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. Um, 
more than half of students agreed that their performance as a student was worsened uh, since the on-site uh, on classes were cancelled. Uh, nearly half of them said, uh, in contrast to that, that they've adapted well to the new teaching and learning experience. Um, then uh, about 45% uh, percent said that they could master the skills in class this year, even, even without on-site classes. Um, and about a third of students said that they can figure out how to do the most difficult classwork, uh, even since uh, on-site classes were cancelled. And then lastly, about uh, a bit less than a quarter of students said that their performance had uh, improved since uh, on-site classes were cancelled. And lastly, um, we asked students about their workload, uh, whether their workload was uh, significantly smaller, smaller, larger, or significantly larger. And about 60% said it was either larger uh, or significantly larger. And I, and I think these results are really telling in terms of how students were experiencing the shift uh, to, uh, to online teaching and learning. Um, in particular, that more difficult to focus I think is, is kind of important in terms of thinking about how it is that students adapt um, to uh, online teaching and learning when they had started out the, the semester expecting to be uh, in person. And um, one of the things uh, when we look at the demographic characteristics, there's nothing that really stands out, um, but when we look at the socioeconomic characteristics and how they relate uh, to students' experiences uh, on these dimensions, um, high ability to pay really stands out. So students who reported a high ability to pay uh, reported that they had less difficulty focusing. So about 75% of students overall were saying they had difficulty focusing, but um, significantly less uh, students who had high ability to pay for their studies said that than those who had low ability to pay. Um, students who had uh, high ability to pay were less likely to say that their performance had worsened. They were more likely to say their performance had improved, and they were more likely to say that they could uh, figure out the difficult classwork. So there was a really strong, I guess, um, difference there between the students who um, who had resources available to them um, from those that didn't uh, in terms of how they were able to adapt uh, to learning in the online environment. Um, so then we asked um, a bunch of questions of, about the sorts of resources that students actually had access to. Um, and you'd kind of hope that most students had access to most of these things uh, because these are the sorts of things that we would want them to have uh, access to. Uh, to improve their online learning. So having access to a computer, uh, fortunately nearly all students had access to a computer. Um, presumably those who didn't have access to a computer had access to a tablet or a phone or some other way uh, of engaging. Otherwise they wouldn't have been able to complete our survey. Um, so uh, we know that they had access to something. Um, office supplies, most of them had access to that. Webcam, same thing. Uh, headphones and microphone, we, these are all around 90% or more of students have access to these things. Um, even required software and programs, most students had access to those things. Um, the things that less students had access to, a, a desk, um, study materials, talking about two thirds of students having those, a good internet connection, uh, which uh, when you're moving to video lectures or when you're moving to Zoom, as we as we all know, uh, you need a good internet connection for these things, uh, but about a third of students reported that they didn't have access to a good internet connection. Um, and perhaps even worse than that, uh, only only slightly more than half had a quiet place to study. Uh, and that's a point that we'll come back to a little bit later. Um, having access to a printer, uh, probably the least important of all of these things, but only about 45% of students had access to a, to a printer. Um, and in terms, there were no real um, strong differences by demographic or socioeconomic characteristics in access to most in access to these things. Um, and I guess that reflects that for most of these items, most students had access to them. But but the one thing that did uh, jump out was the students who had moved home uh, were much less likely to have a quiet place available for study. Um, 
And I think that's important uh, for us to recognise as well. I mean, those students who were in situ at, uh, at, uh, on campus um, and then had to move home, probably were moving back uh, to an environment that was already very crowded with, uh, with family and, and siblings and so on. Uh, they were much less likely to have a quiet place available to study. Um, so what was, uh, what was studying at home like? Um, well, we asked them about their confidence, uh, their confidence in using different things or, or finding information and so on. So this is the proportion of students who either agreed or strongly agreed that they're confident in firstly using online communication platforms. Nearly 100% of students said that they were confident with using email and messaging, um, which I don't think should be a surprise to any of us. Um, Browsing online information, again, more than 90%. Uh, confident in using the online teaching platforms like Moodle or Blackboard or, or whatever learning management system uh, the university uses. Most students, again, were confident in that. Uh, sharing digital content, uh, about 85% of students were confident in that. <clears throat> uh, using uh, Zoom or Teams or Skype or any of those sort of uh, collaboration or video tools, um, more than 85% again uh, were confident with that. Using software programs that are required for their studies, we're getting down to around 75%. And then applying advanced settings to some software and programs, uh, less than half of students were confident with, confident with that. Um, there were no uh, strong or, or um, uh, consistent uh, differences here by demographics or by uh, socioeconomic uh, characteristics. And the last thing we asked about um, was about students' emotional experiences, their, their emotions during lockdown. Um, and here's where things sort of sort of really jump out. Um, because about two-thirds of students reported that they were feeling frustrated. And about two-thirds of students reported that they were feeling anxious. And nearly half of students were bored. Um, and then all of the other emotions were, were much less uh, prevalent. So that's hopelessness, hopefulness. Uh, anger, pride, uh, relief, uh, joy, and, and shame, um, those were all uh, less than a third of students uh, were experiencing uh, any of those things. Um, interestingly, uh, when we look at the differences by demographic categories, female students were uh, more likely to be feeling frustrated and anxious, um, and they were less likely to be feeling um, proud. Um, and uh, the older students, that's uh, those who are aged over 30, um, they were less likely to report being anxious or bored or hopeless, uh, which presumably means that the younger students were more likely uh, to be feeling uh, anxious or bored or, or hopeless uh, during lockdowns. So... Turning to the, the qualitative side, um, I'm not going to uh, uh, labour the, the qualitative side too much. Um, it's in the paper uh, and I invite you to read it. Um, I could spend a lot of time uh, drilling down to some of the quotes uh, from the paper, but, um, but we identified that there were three overarching themes in what the students were saying. They were about collectivity, about emotions and about higher education more generally. Um, there were, there were sub-themes in each of those of those themes, and we've given some examples uh, related to those in the paper. So feel free to read read and read a little bit more about that there. Um, but the strongest thematic aspect actually goes back to the last thing I was talking about from the quantitative work, which is the number of comments that actually express different types of emotional responses to COVID-19 or, or the lockdown. So some examples of, of um, Quotes that that uh, from the uh, from that open-ended question, uh, 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 alien, stressful, unreal threat. It's all been quite unknown. It's been incredibly stressful financially and also in terms of future life prospects regarding work, study, and travel in particular. And and if we were to sort of generalise across all of the comments uh, that we received, there was a, students were feeling a lot of uncertainty. They were feeling a lot of anxiety. They were feeling a lot of frustration with, uh, with the universities, frustration with the authorities more generally, um, 
And all of these things were sort of interrelated to each other. It's difficult to disentangle the emotional responses that students were giving us from, uh, from their uh, responses more generally. So how did our students, New Zealand students, compare with the international students? Well, on the whole, uh, the New Zealand students seem to be quite satisfied to the extent that you can be with uh, with suddenly being confronted with something that's very different from what you signed up for uh, in the beginning. Um, they seem to be quite satisfied with the change uh, to teaching and learning, the switch to online, and certainly they were more satisfied than students from other countries. So if we looked uh, back at some of those quantitative results that I presented earlier, New Zealand students showed a much higher level of satisfaction with teaching and administrative support than the global sample did uh, generally. Um, aside from that, most of the results were kind of similar uh, to the international sample, except when we get to the emotional response. And so New Zealand students reported being much more frustrated than students from other countries. So. 66.1% uh, of the New Zealand students reported being frustrated. Uh, internationally, that was 39.1%. And our students reported being more anxious as well. 64.5% of New Zealand students reported being anxious, and that was 39.8% for the uh, international uh, sample. Um, one thing that I think really came through strongly in the study was equity. Um, and in particular, the difference between students who had high ability to pay and low ability to pay. Um, so students with a high ability to pay showed much greater resilience. And that wasn't just true for New Zealand as well. When we look at the international sample, we see something similar. Right? Students with high ability to pay were much different in terms of how well they were able to respond uh, or how badly the shift effect, uh, affected um, their learning self-reported of course. Uh, so students with low ability to pay, uh, they reported higher levels of difficulty focusing, uh, they're significantly more likely to report that their performance had worsened and much um, less likely to say that their performance had improved, uh, less likely to report confidence with mastering skills and figuring out how to do the most difficult classwork. And so that was similar again um, with the international sample. Um, I guess one of the one of the limitations that we faced though in doing this work was that things that we would have been interested in in the New Zealand context um, were less important in the international context, and so we missed out on on some things that we thought we we would really like to know about. And in relation to equity, it would have been really nice for us to know whether there were differences by ethnic group and whether there are differences by disability status. But those questions weren't asked in the international survey and we didn't have any control over that. So um, just to head off uh, any questions, uh, I'm sure I uh, have anticipated your questions about whether Maori and non-Maori students in particular or whether students with disabilities and, and without uh, were gonna be different. We simply can't answer those questions. Um, so what do we learn from a study like this? Well. Um, studies of online learning are often problematic. Um, the problematic because of selection bias. The types of students who sign up for online learning are meaningfully different from students who uh, study in person. So, so a naive comparison of uh, students online to students in person uh, is never really going to tell us whether online is better than in person or the other way around. Um, on the other hand, our study doesn't really answer that question either uh, because uh, we forced every student online. Um, and um, while forcing all students online might be one way of getting at some answer to that question, it was the contextual factors, of course. We, we did it in an environment where uh, it was incredibly stressful. Uh, students were frustrated and anxious, we know, as a result of that. So uh, it really, the, this study doesn't tell us very very much at all about whether studying online is better or worse than studying in person. Um, so we need to be very careful uh, about how we interpret the results. Uh, what our study does show is that uh, most but not all students uh, cope well with online study. And most but not all students are resilient to even dramatic upheavals in their study. Um, and I think both of those things are kind of important because 
Um, it's not just during pandemics that students' study may be disrupted where uh, everything has to shift online. Uh, we've seen it as well uh, during the earthquakes in Christchurch uh, where we had similar disruptions to, to students' uh, uh, study experiences and, and our results speak to that to the to the sense that uh, that students are actually quite resilient when you have to make uh, dramatic changes. Um, however, a couple of things that we can really take away uh, is that communication is really important. Keeping students informed is really important as well. Um, I mean, students were uh, less satisfied with the PR and social media and stuff strategies uh, of the universities than they were with uh, teaching staff, for instance. And to some extent, that might be uh, that students were identifying that teaching staff were also under a lot of pressure. Um, but uh, we also know that students were, were feeling a great degree of uncertainty um, and uh, keeping students informed, keeping uh, these lines of communication open is really important for uh, reducing that, that uncertainty for students. And emotional and mental health support is gonna be really important when we go through these changes. We know uh, that there's uh, a mental health crisis going on, uh, these sorts of dramatic shifts, of course, just double down on that. Um, and uh, when we think about where students were least satisfied with the support they were getting, one of those was counselling services. Um, I think that that speaks to just, just how much pressure the students and indeed the counsellors were under at that time. Um, so just to finish a little bit of an, uh, of an epilogue, what, what's happened since, since then, this is not in the paper, of course, um, Universities have moved uh, back to in-person study. Um, interestingly, though, um, some of the some of the changes got bedded in. So, um, a lot of lecturers, uh, because of this disruption, they were forced to revisit their assumptions about teaching and learning, whether that's online and in person. Um, some lecturers have maintained uh, a lot of the things that they shifted to, that they were forced to shift to. Uh, that at the time they probably thought was second best, uh, some of them have adopted those uh, and retained them, even though we've now moved mostly back to in-person study. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting. There, there was a study uh, a few years ago uh, which looked at uh, disruptions to commuting patterns in, in London when some of the public transport uh, was unavailable and people who used to take certain routes when they were going to and from work uh, commuting in the morning and evenings. Of course, they couldn't do that anymore. But then when uh, public transport was restored, uh, some of them continued uh, on the new routes that they'd discovered. So there's something to be said for sometimes just disrupting people and allowing them to find better ways of doing things. And I think uh, that if we if there's one positive thing that's come out of the pandemic, um, that's probably been one of the things from, from uh, the perspective of teaching and learning is that uh, some lecturers have really been forced to adjust their approach and have actually found things that work better for them and for their students. Um, interestingly, uh, the students who started their studies uh, in 2020 became kind of socialised to online study. So even when we moved back to in-person, uh, those students who started their studies in 2020 appeared to uh, prefer to continue uh, online, even though they could have come to class. Um, and then uh, the reverse has happened as well. Um, I teach uh, first year economics and I can tell you that the first year cohort has moved back the other way. Uh, these are students who would have been in year 11 uh, during the lockdowns in 2020. Uh, they haven't been uh, quite so socialized to online study uh, and their experience because they were a bit younger uh, might have not been quite so good, um, but they certainly seem to prefer in-person classes much more so uh, than last year's or, or the 2020 classes going through. And that's the presentation. I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Shall I stop sharing, Christina? Thank you, Michael. That would be wonderful so that we can, can see each other. And thank you so much for this uh, summary of the article. And I'm really happy to, to actually have all three co-authors of this paper in the room. So not just Michael, but also Barbara and Gemma. Thanks so much for joining us today. And so audience, please do feel free to direct all your questions to all three of them. 
um, so that uh, they can also chime in. And I see that Simon already has his hand up. So over to you, Simon. I do. I'm, I'm sitting in a strange space. So can you hear me OK? Good. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you've also got one of the um, editors of the journal. So sort of, um, I'm very delighted to have published it. Uh, so it's sort of a two-parter question, sort of for all of you, really. Uh, first, I don't expect you to be able to give me an answer, but has there been any study of any comparative difference between the two institutions? Have you been sort of sharing your dirty laundry, although I wouldn't expect it to be shared more publicly than that? And sort of beyond that is, because it was a large international study, has there been an opportunity to identify which of those institutions that seem to perform, take counselling, for example, who performed really well, and whether there's then an opportunity to build off the back of that in terms of identifying good practice or best practice in any of those particular fields. Hopefully that makes sense. Shall I answer those questions, team? Okay, they're both nodding, so I guess that's over to me. Um, Yes, we could compare between the two institutions. Um, so we could have compared Waikato with Victoria. Um, I'm not sure that it would be necessarily fair to make that comparison, though. So we've we've chosen not to do so. Um, I mean, the the other universities chose not to participate. So simply singling out the two that did choose to participate and then saying this one was good and this one was not. Uh, probably is unfair on both of them because we don't know how they rate relative to the other six who decided not to participate. Um, as for the second question, uh, looking across countries in terms of uh, which countries were students more or less satisfied with the different uh, uh, academic and, and teaching support that they got, um, I think the international report does that to some extent. But I don't think it really goes as far as answering your question, Simon, as to um, what is it about those countries that led to um, them doing well or less well uh, on particular dimensions. And, and to be honest, the, the, the survey is not going to answer that question for us anyway. Right? It's, the surveys are not very well equipped to answer that particular question. Um, but um, you're right, in particular counselling, it would be good to know which countries were doing well because the students across all countries were, were all facing the same sort of uh, challenges. And uh, even though it seems like our students were in particular uh, more frustrated and anxious, I can tell you in some of the young, other countries, um, their students were actually angry as opposed to frustrated or, or, um, or anxious. And, and that, that may well be worse. Yeah, I think it's it's really difficult, isn't it, to to work out how the dislocation, social cultural dislocation, was experienced because we didn't, you couldn't pretest for it. No, there was really no benchmarking. So, and it's all self-reported. Yeah. So, it, it's pos it's not impossible that a large portion of the sample just had really crappy domestic arrangements uh, when they got home. And another country might have had people who had really, you know, great, healthy personal relationships. As well. It's so hard to control for those. But I think, you, I think you, certainly you presented the data very clearly, so it's a good article. And the study as a whole, like you say, it's, uh, it, it feels like it's slightly incomplete, inevitably. Like there's always other questions that you would like to go back and ask. If, if only we could anticipate that these things were going to happen and field a survey in advance, so then we could uh, pre-test for things. You know, that, well, that would be prepare, great. Prepare for the next one. <laughs> um, Diane. Um, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, I uh, have done a little bit of work in this area too, and we've cited your study um, because I really I have read the article and um, enjoyed it tremendously. And there's so much coming out of it that um, we've been able to affirm similar patterns. So my main question is, are you publishing any more in the area? Um, not with this particular study. Um, we could have, uh, so the team from Ljubljana did come back to us um, around uh, fielding a follow-up study. Mm. Um, 
but I kind of felt that because we only got 147 students mm. participating the first time around, I wasn't confident that we were going to get a lot the second time around and, and that it was going to actually add much value. Um, so so I chose, chose not to participate the second time yeah. around. Um, are we doing more in this particular area? Not specific to this, but I have got other research which is looking at... Um, students' responses to the flexible environment that, that we gave them after we came back out of lockdown. So, so something I probably should have said in the epilogue was that um, at, at Waikato we're giving students or have been giving students sometimes two options for papers, uh, do one that's uh, more online and one that's more in person. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got some re research related to that based on my own uh, classes in 2021 as to which students choose which options mm. um, and so uh, so there is some follow-up work but it's not uh, I guess not directly related to this uh, but it's but it's sort of yeah yeah nevertheless likely inspired by this yeah. so that's good to know I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it thanks yeah. Thank you, Michael. I also have a quick question. Um, the, the study focused very much on the students and often I was like, yeah, and why is that? Why is that? How, how can we make that even clearer why certain answers were the way they were? And I was completely stoked that uh, more than 50% actually had a printer. When I look around where I live, people were carrying the printers from the office home, but hardly any office worker would have actually had a printer. And so that was probably the, in a way, the funniest moment of the survey, if one can say that a survey is funny, especially in this context. Um, but my question actually centers a bit more around uh, the lecturers and the university, because in your recommendations at the end or looking, looking forward, um, some of your recommendations are that transparency, kind of being, in a way, being prepared for whatever you can or cannot be prepared. Um, having tools on hand, of course, looking after the students in particular well-being and mental, uh, mental wellness. But also, since we are talking especially here about um, open, online, flexible and distance learning, have you seen any changes um, at maybe even just the University of Waikato, actually, rather than trying to also encompass Victoria, since we don't have anybody from there here? Uh, have you seen any changes where you can say there's uh, there's been innovation also in, in the teaching team or amongst the learning designers so that you can make incremental changes? Because, of course, the emergency remote teaching was very different from what a normal online or flexible learning classroom would look like. Um, so I think there's there's a couple of aspects to your question, Christina. Firstly, we, we and, and this is probably not what you were asking, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Um, we didn't we didn't ask about teaching staff's experiences um so um while we talked a little bit about the emotional uh impact on students we didn't we don't know anything about the emotional impact on on teachers or indeed administration support staff either um who are all facing the same things as what students were um but uh but setting that aside um there's sort of two two aspects to the way things have changed since then i think um, there's how the institution has responded, and there's how individual teaching staff have responded. And so the institutional's response, the institution's response has been a little bit top down, at least in at least in my experience. Um, and and my experience is of course coloured by the fact that I'm in the the management faculty here, and and the management school has put in place a policy that we have to be. Uh, that all of our papers have to be taught in such a way that students don't have to be on campus. And that's been that's been pushed down heavily from above. I know that that, that, that approach is unique to our particular faculty and isn't the same across the university as a whole. Um, but um, individual staff have responded, as I said, um, they were forced to do things um, that they wouldn't necessarily have done um, in other circumstances. Uh, some staff have gone back pretty much to doing the same thing that they were doing before the pandemic. Other staff have changed entirely. Um, I have colleagues here who, prior to the pandemic, were doing all teaching in person, uh, found that um, teaching online worked really well for them. 
uh, during the pandemic to the extent that it could, but then even coming back afterwards, they've retained the online elements that they developed uh, because it worked so well for them and, and they feel like it worked well for their students as well. Um, so there's been a whole range of responses. Um, Gemma, Barbara, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I'll, I'll, one of the things that has, I think that's been incredibly useful is our professional development team uh, has a, a twice daily drop-in session um, and we you can it's called ask me anything and it, and it is and it's it's all built around um, dealing with the online teaching tools like our platform Moodle and, and things like that and um, it's really interesting it's been um, quite an important session for them as a team as well as for um, the wider staff like it was an absolute lifeline um, when the changes were happening um, but yeah it's still highly used and um, and I think it's been really key in ensuring that that team is utilized much more widely um, our, you know our teaching professional development team is often you sort of you'd kind of see the same people at the workshops you know just the whereas though the the universal nature of this experience has meant that a, a lot of people have been really really engaged with their pedagogy in a deep way um in a sustained way which is I think pretty wonderful um but yeah I just wanted to add that that ask me anything session um is I think has been quite fundamental I think if I can add to that at Otago Polytech, which is not the University of Waikato, I have to say, um, but our experience was the School of uh, Community Health and Wellbeing, and we were training counsellors um, and disability and mental health workers, so very much hands-on. The staff only had one hour training on teams before um, we went into lockdown, and then it was extremely rushed and difficult. So a lot of them really struggled because of that two day period that you talked about, Michael, which is true, it was such a rush to go in. And a lot of them were learning by doing. And what you're saying, Gemma, we had um, uh, a weekly, well, for a start, they started daily, but then it was sort of weekly for people who didn't know what they were doing um, as lecturers. So I think there was initially a lot of dissatisfaction from students. And the other factor I would like to add is I did actually request the New Zealand Polytechs to join in the um, survey, but they had decided around the same time to actually do their own survey, um, which I did see the results, but it was a four question survey. It was quite different to ours and it was very, I showed it to Michael, but it was very um, brief and quite particular to Polytechs. The other study that's probably good to alert people to is the um, Akuhata Huntington study from Otago University, though we found that really interesting in our review because it was um, the Otago Māori Students Association. And that's one, if you want to delve into that area a little bit more, that was one that we came across that was um, very interesting. And they had 300 students. So this was quite a big survey compared to ours. But yeah, it's just interesting. I think since going back at the Polytech, um, some people, like you're saying, have actually really adopted things. Some other people have gone back exactly to what they're doing. But ours is probably a lot more um, hands-on and going out into the community in terms of the course. And, you know, placement's really essential and all that. So that supervision and mentoring is really important. So, yeah, I think that's um, the challenge for us and online. Thank you so much for, for sharing that aspect and, and also taking us beyond the, the survey, uh, Michael, with the, the epilogue and uh, also Barbara and Gemma for, for chiming in and talking about your experiences since that survey. And it's uh, definitely good to have other instruments there as well. And uh, Diane, I'll make sure to include the link in our resources when we send out the video so that um, others can also read your paper. So thanks so much for sharing. Can now we are, oh, welcome. Last question. Yeah, just a question. The, um, the students showed like they're very anxious and frustrated over the lockdown period with their 
um, online learning. We were, were you able to find out why? Like, was it the social isolation at home, or or was it their social uh, lack of social um, learning? Yeah, thanks, Malcolm. I think this comes back to Simon's point as well. Um, we um, we don't know why they was frust reporting being frustrated or anxious. Um, we also don't know how frustrated or anxious they were feeling before the pandemic. Um, so, we, so we can't actually even answer the question of whether they were more frustrated or anxious during than before or indeed after. Um, so that's that's just a limitation that we've got to live with with the survey nature. Um, I mean, if, if we were doing this ourselves rather than as part of the international study, we probably would have uh, done a little bit more qualitative work, which would have helped us to really understand the reasons why um, people were feeling the way that they were feeling, particularly when it came out so strongly in the survey. But yeah, I appreciate the question. Sadly, can't can't really answer it, Malcolm. Even, um, even, my, even today, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah um, over the COVID lockdown, my um, our program is delivered 100% online. And for our students, it made no difference to their online learning. But we noticed a very high increase in the need for pastoral care yeah. from the tutor's perspective, and that being flexible, um, difficulty meeting assignment dates, personal circumstances, things like that. So, and, and the students reported satisfaction with being able to get an immediate response from the tutors and also um, the fact that the tutors cared for their learning. And, and that, that's what they kind of crave for, was mm -hmm. that someone was um, betting on their side as far as their learning goes. Yeah, and I think that that probably accords with the results that we found where, where they were most satisfied with teaching staff and with, and with tutors than they were with the, with the other um, sources of support from the university. Um, and it, and it, it also correlates um, really well with, with general literature on online learning. You know, that relationship with the tutor is kind of core to making online learning experiences. Um, but I just wanted to add, while we can't definitively say anything about the frustration, the, the sense of frustration and anxiety, the long answer, that, that one long answer that was given, there were some things, there were some patterns because um, some people wrote quite a, you know, quite a bit, but, um, and you know there were things like um, dealing with being a parent um, and how difficult that was because the kids were at home um, and the other partner were having to work and they're studying and working, so that so that pattern came up, um, and yeah, so those are the sorts of things. So there were frustrations that were kind of triggered from being. Um, at, at home in this environment being locked down um, so yeah uh, we but yeah we can't they weren't um, obviously not everyone wrote down things like that they not not everyone shared um, their sense of frustration um, but yeah and the, were... the whole equity yeah oh, sorry. sorry okay I think the whole equity factor there too, um, Gemma, came through quite strongly, didn't it as well? Yeah. Access to resources and yeah, if you don't have what you need to study, very difficult for people. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that is a good point for us to stop and remind everybody if they haven't already read the uh, article in the journal to take it at end and dissect it a bit more and yes not just focus so much on the why because we can all the the article and this so we couldn't answer that necessarily but see kind of what you can make with the data how it compares to your own experience because I think all of you have actually been teaching through that period and so all of um, all of us have that lived experience of having gone through the lockdown and then maybe it does encourage you to have some of those conversations with students. Um, now, of course, it's very different because it's very much hindsight to two years, um, three years afterwards, but they, um, it's, it's still close by that people will remember it. And so 
you'll see what comes out. There's uh, the, the study that Diane pointed to. And I also look forward to a webinar that we are going to have with Diane later in the year on some topic of um, flexible and online and distance learning. And so I'd yeah, really just encourage you to engage with the with the article, with the survey, but also I guess contact Michael, Barbara, and Gemma if you have any follow-up questions or maybe want to rope them into another study or see what they have planned more concretely. Before I let you go, um, I do want to point you to our next webinar that we are organizing actually in exactly a month on the 18th of May. It is in conjunction with EdTech New Zealand. And since it's Tech Week, um, everything revolves around AI, artificial intelligence, not academic integrity, though that might play a role as well. But yes, um, have look at a little bit at AI, both for the schooling sector and also the tertiary sector. So I look forward to this panel of um, experts and growing experts and I'm really stoked also to have a colleague from Australia on the panel who has been researching in that area as an early career researcher in a lab that is led by George Siemens. In June we will be looking at bicultural principles of online learning. That is um, a book, you might have already heard about it, um, where Arapera Card and Hosina Mary are editors. And it is a book um, that shares the experiences and the research from Thierry Tomayoha in particular, but I think is very applicable also to, to the wider tertiary sector. So the information about that webinar will be shared shortly on the FLANS website. And if you're subscribed to any updates also through Humanitex, you will get a notification immediately. And before we go, just to round us up, I'd like to thank all of you very much for having been here and would like to close with a karakia so that we can then um, leave the space and move forward and outside again to returning to our activities. Kia pakaraya te tapu, kia vatia ai te ara, kia turoki pakataha ai, kia turoki pakataha ai, homie e. Kui Taiki. Kia ora. <laughs>